hi good morning and thanks so much for joining me here it's January 26th still very very cold here where I live and I got a little cold in my shop here yesterday as I slid down a rabbit hole into a situation that well it's of my making well, it's certainly not what I intended or had hoped for now I use the grind down the intermediate wheel technique to get rid of the hard surface on the intermediate wheel and of course I've shrunken the diameter of the intermediate wheel a little bit by doing that and the result is the traction has fallen to nearly nothing in the player which means the dimension of the, uh, the diameter of that intermediate wheel is really critical I've done lots and lots of record players and I followed that same procedure many 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 times and it's always worked except for one other case and that other case is exactly the same model of record player. <laughs> so this particular model, this is the uh, 40 MK2, Mark II, 40 Mark II. Um, the size of the intermediate wheel is far more uh, critical. and doesn't have much tolerance compared to many other record players. So never run into this problem. Well, only once before. How I solved it last time around, I can't remember. I ground out the slot uh, that the shaft is, is going through the slot under here on that record player and it seemed to fix it. But I do recall in the back of my mind that it never really came up to the kind of strong traction that you really want in a record player like this. It was good enough. So maybe I didn't grind that wheel down quite so far on the other player. This one had some deep divots in it and they needed to be essentially ground out basically. So here I am. Now the good part of the story is it's forced me to look more closely at the operation of this very simple piece of bent metal. Turns out this zigzag piece of metal is actually pretty brainy inside here. It's performing a number of functions simultaneously uh, that I did not appreciate. I've certainly known about it for, I mean, forever. The funny shape in it I always thought was just the way the the mechanism reaches its stop points. That's, I just thought that's all these, these bumps were just to, to lock it in at certain positions. Turns out it's a little more than that. At the same time the you can see the width of it is not so wide here and much wider here. And this, this produces a ramp. And as you advance this metal through here it causes a variation in the height of the uh, intermediate wheel, which you can see. You can see it go up, 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 and then it engages with the motor spindle at different different heights, different uh, widths, diameters, I guess, giving you the different speeds. Now I've come to realize there's a little more going on here, and this is a very clever little solution to a number of problems. One is raising and lowering the intermediate wheel to engage different speeds. But another one is backing the wheel away from the motor spindle during the change of speed. So if you didn't do that, I'll grab the wheel. I'll pretend that's the motor spindle. Then operating this would simply drag this up and down the side of the spindle. And that spindle has different widths. So on the way down it would it would hit the shoulder of the next width and get caught. Some of these players, I'm pretty sure the instructions are to not change the speed unless the player is operating. Could be in those players they're counting on the wheel climbing over these edges, actually coming down and then climbing over. Just being pushed over. Be a little rough on the wheel. But in this player, as you move this control, very briefly, the wheel is pulled away from the spindle. So it's doing this action. But this is what I this is what I did not appreciate is going on. So that, that's achieved by using this row of zigzags. And there's two uh, shafts that are engaging with the zigzags. 
one shaft is fixed in place that's this one and as you move the shaft and I'm starting to explain this to myself at this point too as you move the shaft you change speed and move the not the shaft the uh, the zigzag back and forth it has to ride up over this ca causing it to move in this direction like this so just by virtue of this piece of metal moving like this you get this piece moving and this is the idle, idler wheel, idler wheel or intermediate wheel moving up above. That's the pulling away function happening. You're moving this and getting that. And when you select the speed and it settles into the speed spot, both this shaft, I'm pretty sure, and this shaft in here, not. I was going to say fall, fall into the uh, bottom of the valley, so to speak. This doesn't seem to be in the bottom of the valley. This one does. So in terms of speed, it's the height here that's critical for selecting the right diameter on the spindle. Well, okay, so the whole time I've been thinking about this in my head, I've pictured both this shaft and this shaft falling deep into these grooves, and they just designed it so it would do that. But this is not deep in the groove. I don't think it, nothing's wrong here, it's just the way it works. Yeah, it's, it's just a little up on the edge. I need to have this sh shaft or this part of the mechanism settling in a place where the uh, intermediate wheel is going to be making enough pressure contact. I have a number of options here looking at the back. I'm not saying they're good options or I'm going to do them, but here's the options. One of the obvious ones is bend this piece of metal somehow bend it to accommodate the situation in the record player. You bend it into a curve this way. Assumably it's straight, maybe it's not even straight. It may actually actually have a bend in it already, I don't know. <clears throat> this is now gone f f to me from being a funny little bent piece of metal to a high precision component in the record player. Bending it doesn't look easy. It's a fairly heavy piece of metal here. <clears throat> Looks like you could extract it fairly easily, but I'm not sure of that either. It's caught on a hook over here. Pro probably, probably not easy. Probably have to take this mechanism out of here somehow. And of course you just get deeper and deeper into trouble. The deeper you go, the deeper you are. So what I'm doing here, just in case you haven't figured it out, I'm just rolling all this over in my mind before I take an action. But I do have something. I do have something in mind now. In terms of uh, problem solving in a situation like this, I usually like to stack up the different options in order, but not in order of most likely to succeed. I stack them up in order of least likely to cause a bigger problem, or, or least risky at the front. And up at the front of the list would be things that are undoable. So if I do something and it doesn't work out, I can undo it. So I, I'm pretty happy to try that stuff, even if, even if they are long shots. So for example, bending this piece of metal to try to solve the problem. Well, that's risky on many levels, not the least of which is it could be completely wrong. I could deduce I should bend the metal one way and then find out, oh my gosh, that's actually the wrong way. I should have, should have bent it the other way. Or I bend the metal, <coughs> maybe introduce a new problem. Um, bending a heavy piece of metal requires a lot of heavy, heavy uh, energy and force. That in itself is a little dangerous. 
So, you know, another possibility is uh, this, this piece of metal is, is trapped here just by the shape of the hook here. You can re reshape the hook a little bit, maybe trap it a little, a little further in, if that's the right way. Could be as simple as that. But there's another option here. So none of these are attractive to me. Never tried anything like it. This isn't my record player. If it was my record player, I'd, I'd be a little more um, aggressive with it. But there is another element here that might just do the trick. I mean, it really needs to be tried, and it's a, it's a reversible thing, and it's a low impact, and nothing's getting bent. And that's the spring tension on the uh, on the intermediate wheel. Let's turn this over. So you can see a couple springs up here. This one here and this one here. This is the one we're interested in. The thing about this spring is that it's not very strong. This is not a strong spring. Change speed, you can kind of kind of not see what it's doing. Okay, I've lost my mind for a minute. But th this piece will will move back here too. I think maybe it's this. Yeah. Let's put that like that. This gives you some idea of the kind of tension that's here. Now, normally there's the intermediate wheel on here, and that pushes this a little bit. And this spring is barely opening. It's very weak. You can put a really strong spring in here. I think you end up feeling it over here and feeling it here. So what are nice light operations become tougher. Also, you tension this spring up or put a stronger spring in, you're going to pull the intermediate wheel harder into the uh, capistan, can I call it that? Into the motor shaft here, and also into the rim underneath the uh, platter. It's not a particularly bad thing, I don't think. It depends, I mean, obviously there's a limit to how hard you can, you can set this up. You're going to be applying pressure to the motor, going to cause the motor uh, bearings to, to do to work harder but I think this is one thing I can fool with here and just see if by some chance just pulling harder on this is enough to, to overcome the situation that I'm in right now because we are talking about fractions of a millimeter I believe a tiny tiny amount that's all I have to really achieve with a spring like this, there's an obvious opportunity to simply uh, pull the spring tighter. Uh, just refit it on here so it's pulled tighter. In doing that, you're going to disrupt the spring. And it's never going to be the same again. So I've done that before with other record players, and without too much thought, um, because I didn't have any concern that I would have to restore the spring back to the way it was. And I don't have much concern here either. Uh, so I could go ahead, it's just a simple matter of kind of taking five, six of these turns here, pulling them out, and then creating a hook just like there is here now, and you have a stronger spring. But I do have a set of springs here uh, we can look through. I can pick an alternate spring even from sort of an experimental point of view. You notice too the, the angle here, what speed are we on? We're on 16. So we're aiming for the tiniest spindle here. So this is up. The spring is actually pulling this downwards a little bit. So that, that's probably not the most desirable thing. Let me put this back like this. Because you're trying to line up the wheel with exactly in here. And if you put too much pressure on this, it's maybe going to pull it down a little bit. That's my option though. So I'm going to stop, drink a little coffee, think about this, 
We're going to look at some springs, put one in, do an experiment, see if that corrects the uh, drive problem, and then consider the permanent change, if it does, a permanent change either to this spring or, or a different spring in there. That's step one, because it's eminently reversible, low impact, nothing getting bent, and I don't have to sweat while I'm doing it. Okay, just before I go any further, what are the chances that I happen to have one of these wheels? Pretty darn low. Let's take a look at this. Phono drive kit. Master shop assortment. That sounds pretty hopeful. Some Garrard models listed here. Model T Mark II. 98 Mark II. There we are. Now, of course, these are old wheels too. <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing particularly wonderful about these. Still in the bag. One of the drive wheel. Two bucks for use on Aero, Bell, Sound System, Columbia, Corona, Deca, GE, RCA, Roland, Silvertone. Wow. That goes on everything. That's what we're trying to duplicate. You know, the difficulty here is this: this height has to be exactly correct. A lot of things have to be exactly correct. The width of this has to be correct. A lot of things have to be correct. Not the least of which is the rubber has to be rubbery too. This one's pretty close. Hmm. I wonder. Once again, on the basis that uh, you can try things, you know, that cannot be undone, and you can try things that can be undone. Just maybe that one is the right, the right size for this big whopper here. I grind that down to the right size. This is too wide. This is too long. Okay, I have a few springs in here too. Little cartridges. Why would I have this in here? I mean, this is a uh, transistor look inside it and see the actual transistor in there. Put it under a microscope or magnifier to really see it. I don't know why I have it in here. The chances of this working are so small. Will it even fit on here? No, it won't even fit. Many, many, many different wheels out there. Okay, but I thought I'd be smart to check. There's nothing inside there. A lot of the stuff in here is just is old and beat up anyway. Inside my box here. Okay, that's over. I have an assortment of springs here. The vast majority are not at all appropriate. There is some. Super long, but I can always cut it to any length I like. So that might give us a, a very strong pull that I'm looking for, especially just on a test basis. Put it on, test it. Is it is it helping at all? You can worry about refining it afterwards. That's really about it. Oh no, here's some more here. Not so strong. This is much weaker yet, but uh, 
That's another possibility. I have to cut that to, 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 to get it to do something. Okay, well, I didn't get a chance to drink coffee because I forgot to turn the coffee machine on. So by now, my pot is full. Now I'm going to go and drink a little coffee here. Got my fingers crossed. Not on the coffee, on, on the spring. Okay, I drank some coffee and I watched uh, Dr. John Campbell Campbell's video for today. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on his videos. Um, I think he provides an awful lot of information for, for people to think about and, uh, and the like. So he does a daily video. Dr. John Campbell in England. Okay, now on a test basis I should put in a very strong spring kind of push this thing, uh, say, uh, over the normal operating tension that I would want it to have just to see if this is going to work or not. This is probably the right one to use. Let's do that. I'm going to take this one out. Can I do damage by... You know, I can just leave that like that, maybe? Ah, maybe not. By putting in too heavy a, a spring. Well, obviously, there's some kind of limit here. I think I'm anywhere near it, so. I notice I'm wearing a lot of clothes. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got a shirt, I got a shirt, got a big heavy house coat on. distort these at all so I got exactly the same spring tension back yeah this is this has got to be five five times the pull or more here I guess you could measure that somehow Another thing I was thinking about is uh, while I'm examining this, I'm often doing it without the uh, wheel and the platter in place. And so when I look at the parts underneath, they're not in the position that they might be in if the whole thing was assembled. So that might be something worth looking at. Because again, part of what's going on in a record player like this is when it's in play mode, when the needle's actually on the record and you're listening to it, they want as much of the mechanics away from everything that might deliver noise, rumble, anything. So that would be true of this wheel. This wheel is up against this. This is going to have a bit of a hum in it. You can't, can't avoid it. It's, it's fed with uh, AC power. It's going to have a little bit of a hum in it. And you want things to be arranged so that the transmission of that sound, rumble, whatever, is, is reduced as much as possible. Another reason why this is probably as weak as you can get away with is probably how it's designed. I don't know. Oh my gosh, you know what I did? I think I put the wheel in my box and put it away. Yes, I've stolen the wheel. Stole the wheel here. Okay, I gotta stop for a minute and dig it out. Okie doke. Let's put this into manual mode. Just feel this. Oh, that's quite a pull. That's, that's, that's just exactly what I'm after. So if I do this and the traction doesn't improve uh, substantially, then uh, that tells me I'm barking up the wrong tree because I put a pretty strong tree in there. Let's see. Does that even make sense what I just said? Okay. 
Here we go. What are you going to do this time? Okay, we're on 16. Let's go up to 33. Traction. Much better. Much, much better. I'm pushing pretty hard now. That would be satisfactory. That would be satisfactory. Okay, Mr. Rucker Player. Let's see if you uh, can, can, can get over everything. I was just going to say, it's not good to touch these things while the needle's down. <laughs> For that exact reason there. I want that over there. Okay, Mr. Record Player, can you do it? Now we're watching for any slowdown. We're laboring, laboring here. Oh, fantastic. Okay, fantastic. There we go. There we go. Now, why wouldn't I leave that spring in there and just leave everything as it is? When the... Let, let, let's try this uh, push it on auto here. This essentially... I remember I was explaining about the uh, velocity sensor. This essentially kicks the velocity sensor. I don't like the tut 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 but... Uh, oops, I meant to do this. Yeah, it's easily getting past the uh, tough, tough parts in the mechanical routine. Off it goes. There we are. Wow. Good thing. Good thing. So I, I you know, what? Before I've, I've learned the hard way many times that if you get an idea and you just jump forward with it, you can go deeper and deeper in the rabbit hole. It's a lot better to try to rack up as many ideas as possible sort them out as I explained in terms of risk uh, you know uh, undoability and stuff like that before going ahead uh, not just with record players but with everything everything in life well that's fantastic so for now I'm gonna leave that that heavy spring in there you can see the record player is disengaged from the intermediate wheel or it wouldn't spin like this when I pushed it so that means that the mechanics have pushed the intermediate wheel away from things it's just sitting out in space now. Won't develop a uh, flat spot. It develops a flat spot when somebody interrupts the operation of the record player and leaves it. Maybe maybe leave this switch like this. Maybe in the manual position. Could be the whole machine is unplugged, put away for storage, or not run for a long time, and this is sitting in the manual position. And uh, there you go. We don't want that to happen. But in this position, the wheel is, is protected, even though there's a strong spring in there. Oh, I'm so happy. Very good. Okay. Whew. I've emerged from the rabbit hole for now. Anyway, rabbit hole's not far away. In fact, look, I see some more. There's some more rabbit holes around. Okay, next step is to uh, get involved with the cartridge and the needle. So I think the simple thing to do is to play a record a little bit. Um, simple maybe is a strong term here. I'm going to try first off we're gonna we're gonna plug this right into my audio system you're listening to me through I have a way of doing that now this is not the original record player from the uh, console this is a replacement it's a far better player I'm sure the original one claimed to have a magnetic cartridge magnetic cartridges don't produce much voltage so the amplifier has to be stronger so if you switch this, switch the cartridge, and you switched it from a magnetic to a ceramic, ceramics put out way more voltage. Almost a volt will come out of a ceramic cartridge. That would way overdo things, and you, it, the sound would be terrible, no matter what you did. It'd be very loud and very distorted. Well, that can't be the case, because the person who put this in here, I'm sure, knew what they were doing. So this has to be a magnetic cartridge here, too. The other, the other sign that this is a better cartridge is again this counterbalance back here 
So the difficulty here is that this is a low output. I'm going to put this into a microphone mixer. Hopefully there's enough signal to, to make this work. Now I may also hum a bit. I may not be able to control the hum for a couple of reasons. Um, so, But the hum may be uh, something which is an artifact of doing this on my bench, if there is a hum. So give me a couple of minutes to get that sorted out, and uh, we'll try it out. Okay, time to find out if the cartridge works. Boy, oh boy. So just to show you the uh, way I'm doing this. So here's the output going onto this extension wire. Comes over here to my O2 complicated sound system. This is what you're listening to me through, um, this box over here. These are my microphones here. Stereo microphone and a mono microphone that I keep running all the time, if I remember. This is the input from the output of this. Uh, I have to have this box here because I need more inputs than are on the back of this. So that's just, that's what this is doing. Just added complication. You can see one of them turned up full, and that's the one that the cord's plugged into. If I turn this up, we hear the hum. Now, that hum is probably not present when all this is back together in its uh, native console, but here in my shop, for some reason, I'm not able to reduce this hum. I just tried grounding it out. I, I couldn't do it. I uh, struggled with this before. I don't know exactly why it's humming. It's possible. It's humming because the power supply to the motor is unusual here in, on my bench. I have an isolation transformer and other stuff, and it could be that, believe it or not, the AC power system just here on my bench is floating in space, and it itself is picking up hum. And I, I don't know. I can't seem to can't seem to resolve it. We won't worry about it. Just ignore it. Ignore the hum. Does the cartridge work? Now, in a lot of record players, I'm turning up the sound a little bit. A lot of record players, when the record player is in the off position, the needle is disconnected, or the cartridge is disconnected. And that's so you can't hear the mechanical noises as the cartridge comes up and goes over. Uh, so I'm just going to touch it with the back of my nail a little bit. And we certainly hear that, and no question. So something's going to happen here. Uh, let me put this up. Yeah, I'm an anti-hum. Yeah, all that scratchy sound, all that stuff has to do with, with the situation here. With uh, I'm so surprised I couldn't uh, couldn't ground it away. You know what I didn't try? I, I was grounding against this cable. Let me just grab my cord here again. Try another grounding against a different place. What if I ground against yeah, here? Now. All I'm going to do is just touch this to something grounded over here. Voila. Fantastic. Okay, let me make that a little more permanent. And, uh, yeah, so, so th this cable, this cable, this cable must not be attached. Yeah, it's not. Here's the green wire. It looks like it's just ending over there. So th this cable will help as long as it's grounded somewhere. And probably when, when we look at the amplifier and the rest of the uh, console, we'll discover how that's grounded. But uh, normally, and, and plus this green wire is going to override anything anyway. The, the green one, the green wire is connected back to the radio chassis, the amplifier chassis. That must be developing static charges every time I move around because every time I touch this, you hear a click, 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 click. A little static voltage is building up. Not surprising, the humidity in my house, like any Canadian house, is extremely low, or any house in a cold, cold environment is extremely low. If we take no action in this house to push up the humidity, it will fall to 15%. At 15% you're having nosebleeds, furniture is cracking, walls are separating, bad things are happening, everything is shrinking. So by use of humidifiers and that, I'm able to hold it up around 21, 22%. That's the best I can do. Apparently, comfort is 30 to 50% humidity. Well, no, no, we never get there. So lots of static charges all the time. What am I doing? Looking for a long clip lead here. Okay, trying to not 
forget, uh, in order for me to hear the sound that you're hearing, I have to wear these headphones. I don't like wearing headphones because sooner or later I take a little walk and yank something off the shelf or whatever. Show me a, show me a clip leak. Maybe not my thing. See, I've gotten a little excited now because I can see that the, uh, the green light is on for this record player. Success is coming. But let's try this one again. Maybe I can just kind of stuff it under here. Just, just do something stupid here. Almost got it. Just, just, just give me a, okay, another cookie here. Let's try this. I guess I should do something a little more permanent here in my shop. Okay, got rid of the hum. Means we can turn it up a little bit. That should be pretty pretty loud now. I don't hear any hum or anything. Excellent. Very good. Don't know don't know why I haven't achieved that before. Now, uh, my uh, on my videos I have to avoid playing copyrighted music. Uh, YouTube algorithm will pick up as little as eight or ten seconds of copyrighted music, and that's enough for the owner of the music to steal the. Uh, 50 cents I'm going to make on this video and I don't want that to happen so uh, a couple solutions for that I've discovered one is play the record at the wrong speed and their algorithm can't pick up on it that, that's one way uh, of course that kind of wrecks the sound a little bit the other way is just uh, I can uh, do time slicing uh, on the sound on the video and chop out every five seconds chop out half a second but that's enough to confuse their algorithm not recognize the music that I'm playing but the best one of all is just play very brief moments and that's what I'm going to try to do here so it's a little ugly here we go are you gonna work <laughs> oh it's getting worse whatever that is here we go hand on the volume control here Oops. Okay. So the other problem I have in my shop, and I just I just demonstrated, is these headphones are very very quiet. I can't I can't accommodate the volume level in this. Yes, I can, Jim. Yes, you can. I know how to do it? I gotta plug them into a different amplifier here. Oh yeah. Okay. So now I'm hearing the same volume you're hearing. Uh, in the past, there's been a few times where in order to get the sound level high enough in my headphones, I crank it up. Sounds good to me. Totally overloaded on the video. I almost made that mistake here. Let's let's try it again. Because I think that was probably pretty distorted. Excellent, 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 excellent. Okay, I don't want to get a copyright hit. Occasionally I put a video up with, whoops, a little bit of uh, music and then I get a copyright hit. I have to re-edit the video to do uh, something to get, to get rid of it. Oh, that's terrible, I don't like that. That's really fast. Da -da 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 -da. What would that be? Da -da 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 -da. So the, the speed, the velocity sensor here, you know, it only kind of kicks in once a revolution. So it'd be like, click, click, click. Where the click, 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 click comes from, I don't know. I don't know. Won't worry about it right at the moment. Okay, so fact is, cartridge works good. Everything's good. Now we're going to take a look at the needle and just see what condition the needle's in. Typically, a diamond needle on something like this is going to last through about a thousand records like this, whole side plate, so a thousand sides, something like that, when you, you should think about replacing it after that. 
So think about normal record playing today and what this is going to be used for. Chances are, and I'm only guessing because I'm, I'm not the person who owns this, uh, you're going to play maybe, I'm just going to take a wild guess, two records a week. I, I don't know though. They, they could be they've got a big record collection and they're really looking forward to play, play, play. Or maybe it's more at the other extreme. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate it once in a while or hey, why don't we listen to a record today, you know, that kind of thing. So you keep that in mind, you can kind of estimate how long you're going to get out of a needle. So back in the day when records were big, I listened to a couple of records every day. I never changed my needle. Shame, shame, shame on me. Okay, so let's turn this down. It is already turned down before we get in trouble. I'm going to stop. I'm going to get my microscope set up. And we're going to study the condition of the needle as best we can. Great, great, great. Okay, so I brought out my microscope. Uh, this is this is overly fancy looking. This is an old microscope with the original glass optics removed from the top because they had uh, a uh, typical problem in these old microscopes where uh, the, uh, the the lenses become uh, covered with uh, some kind of uh, crystal growth or something that goes on. It puts lines and all kinds of stuff on and gone. And in here I've just inserted a USB microscope, cheap thing, uh, you get these all over the place. Tricky to focus and adjust the zoom on, on these guys. But the advantage of the microscope here is I have pretty precise control on uh, the height of it. Okay, so up at the top, I'm going to flip over to that view and we'll try to position the needle now. Looking at a needle under a microscope is more difficult than you might realize. Uh, you can see it, but making a determination of the quality of it can be a little bit tricky. Now, wh wh where's the needle in this? Where is the needle? So I'm going to guess I have to focus higher to see it. I think it's. I, th I think I think we're kind of looking at it somewhere in here, but it's out of focus. I think that's it right there. Just let me just get my act together here on moving this. There, there we go. Very confusing for me anyway. So I don't think we can get up high enough to focus it. Because, uh, so I'm going to drop the stage down. Or is it down all the way already? Maybe it is. Okay, that's a little bit unfortunate here, but... Oh, no, down it went. Okay, I wasn't really watching what happened. Okay, let's bring this down. There we go. So we're looking right down on the what's called the cantilever and on the end of it is the needle which is a, a little bit of a complicated structure. The actual diamond needle point is a very very small part. The diamond needle point is set into a conical uh, shaped a mold of, of the, some material and then the mold is attached to the cantilever that we're looking at. I don't see the needle at all, but there's clearly a needle there. Let me see if I can figure out how to move this. Let's go up here. So this part here is where the cantilever comes into contact with this bridge part. As you can see it's kind of resting in this bridge part. The bridge part if I, goes down, 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 makes contact with, you know, if this was a crystal, it makes contact with a crystal, or in this case, this is a magnetic cartridge, so it's probably attached to a couple of magnets. And uh, this would be a moving magnet cartridge, and the magnets move with the vibration of the needle. And you can see from the leverage situation, we're not talking about much movement at all here. The needle on the far end is, is moving with the groove, but by here, because of the uh, lever arrangement, not a lot of movement. A little bit transmitted down through, the, uh, through that gripping thing and down into the uh, to, to, to a magnet, the one magnet, this is a mono player and then the uh, magnet moves relative to the coil which is hidden in there and produces a little bit of electricity just like Michael Faraday did many many years ago. Was it Faraday who did this? And when you look back in the history of science and the development of things it's really just a, you know a handful of people hundreds maybe, hundreds, 
maybe hundreds, who are responsible for all the stuff that the, the, the hard won discoveries. Uh, Michael Faraday is a huge figure in that. So looking down at the point, pretty hard to tell anything. What's that yellow glob there? That's kind of weird looking. Can't even tell there's a needle there. So what we would do in a situation like this is, uh, first of all, I cut the light off from the, from the uh, microscope's own light. It has a light that shines directly down on to the uh, specimen. And I'll get a, an adjacent light. Kind of reduce the light in my shop here a little bit. And now I'm going to, I'm shining a, basically a flashlight on it. I can kind of see where the needle is now, but it's, there's a lot of dirt on this. Not surprisingly enough, uh, it's really... Yeah, so there's a technique involved, just like what I'm doing now, where you, you shine the light at different angles and watch for a flash to come off the needle. The flash indicating a flat zone. Yeah, think about this. The needle's dragged through a groove doesn't exactly wear the point off, it wears the sides off because the sides are what are dragging in the groove. The point doesn't, shouldn't reach right to the bottom of the groove. And as you do this, if there's a flat spot, and I'm not doing this very well at all, I find this technique very difficult to, to pull off, you would see it. You, you begin to see the flat spot. But uh, as I say, I've always had trouble doing this technique, not working out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reposition the, the uh, needle so it's sideways. Let me turn the light back on here. This is, this is a little bit tricky in itself. Oh, just with my eyes. It just seems to be a huge glob. Wait a minute. Just a second here. Which, which, which side have we got on here? So that's 78. That would be not visible when looking at this in a normal way. So this means the 78 is the other side. Why don't we take a look at that, just just for interest sake. You know, I can do. I can turn. Hey, I can just turn the needle. Jim, what a good idea! I was going to try to prop the cartridge sideways. We'll just turn the needle. Oh, ooh! Now we're getting a good view of things here. So, on my screen, uh, I'm sure it'd be the same on the video. To the right is the 78 needle focus up here a little bit if I can. And to the left is the uh, needle we were listening to. Oh boy. Now often the 78 one has kind of a pink color because it's made of sapphire. It's softer material. The idea being, and this is the original idea with record players, you wear the needle out and not the record. Use a softer, softer needle. Later records made of vinyl and better materials could take take the torture of having a needle drag through them, and so to extend the life of the needle, they began to use diamond. So looking at the diamond point there, is that even a point? Is that even a fair a fair description of it? Now, now we heard this operate. Let me see if I can just move this uh, more into the center. We, we we heard this operate. That's about the best I can do. Sounded pretty good. Looks like crap. Looks like it's really worn down. Um, so it's a very tricky microscope to utilize the zooming feature. Let's see if what we can do here. Yeah, it's zooming out, so I want to zoom in. Because as you zoom, the focus changes dramatically. Let's see if I can bring it in focus now. Yeah. Okay, so we get a little closer look at it. What are we seeing on the left side there? So what can happen to these needles is one, um, through a rough accident, the entire needle can be ripped away. The, need, the, the diamond point and the cone-shaped material that holds it can all be ripped right off. That's not the case here. The uh, other thing that, that can happen is the uh, diamond needle point can, can be pulled off, broken off. So what will ride in the groove then is the holding material, or whatever it is, some kind of cement or glue or something. 
Um, usually you can tell this uh, because it sounds like crap when you play a record. This one didn't sound like crap. Um, the yellow material on there and the shape of it, it, it looks to me like that's kind of the gluey stuff they've used to hold this whole thing together and freeze it up. But I'm not sure. Yellow is a bit of an unusual color there. So I'd like to try cleaning this first. Could be, if I clean it, it will look fantastic. And in fact, the proper needle tip is sticking out there on the left and it's going in the groove and just doing its thing. Cleaning these, uh, the best way I know of is to use um, a type of foam. Um, oh, luckily, I've got some right here. Great, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this. Let me switch cameras now. Well, this is a technique I heard about and have tried a few times and it's worked really well. What you do is you take the needle. Okay, this is a Mr. Clean Eraser, which is basically a type of foam. And you don't do this. You don't do that. You just dip, 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 dip over and over. And this can have a very positive effect. Let's see if it looks any different. so hard to move this appropriately when it's the image is uh, upside down and backwards or whatever. Here we go. Ooh, that's not the needle. But I got in there. Maybe this way. Here, here we are. Here we are. Is that the needle? Yeah. Well, not, not, not a dramatic change. Now you can kind of see the, the, the point of the, of the thing. So I think it needs a little more aggression on it to clean it up. Put a little uh, alcohol on that and do the dipping thing again. Let's see if we can see if we get an improvement in it. its cleanliness. Well, it's obvious that you could imagine um, Uh, as uh, record debris and dirt and hair and all kinds of stuff builds up on it that you know it starts affecting the sound of course in the worst case the needle doesn't go deep into the groove and then the whole record player becomes very susceptible to skipping not, not the least and, and just ignoring the fact that the sound is going to be crappy I'm dip it in the alcohol give it the uh, Mr. Clean treatment again. I'm going to do the 78 side too. I don't know if the owner wants to play 78s. There are wonderful 78 records if, if, uh, to play. If, if you're into that kind of music, older, like real older music, 1930s stuff, and they sound surprisingly good. You know what? The, you know, I got this thing sideways. What am I doing here? Let me put it back to the. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing this sideways. That, that was dumb of me. Okay, so that's with the 78 showing. Okay, we'll do the 78. That, that's probably why I didn't get a really good effect. I had it sideways so we could see it on the microscope. Okay, dipping, dipping, dipping. Turn it this way. One of the reasons you don't want to drag this through a material is you're going to break it, break the tip off. Okay, 
hands a little shaky. Okay, take a look again. Let's see what we got this time. Did, did we get anywhere? Does it look any different? Okay, so there's the needle. It does look a lot different now. We've got a really good view of the 78 side of it. So now, now you can really see what's going on. And the yellow material must be some kind of gluing kind of thing. If you look at the 78 tip, you can see the very end of it where the actual uh, needle part is. A little roundish at the end, that's okay. I'm not looking for a point on that. The 78 grooves are much wider. Needle's much fatter. But it's really the other side we want to look at. Let me see if I can just get the other one more in the middle here. Okay, so I got So I'm using the stage. Another thing very great about using this kind of uh, microscope is the stage movement controls are very nice. Let me just get this roughly in place. Oh, this smokes like this. It's just crazy. There we go. Okay, now I use the stage controls to move a little more. It's really not looking very good to me. Um, let's put more light on it. Find the focus right on the tip. So what I'm trying to see is the, uh, just like the other needle, first it should be of a similar size, maybe not quite as, you know, overall big as the 78, but it should be something a little bit similar there. Wow. Um, I think we should try the flat thing. So, to do the flat thing, look for flats on the side. I'll flip this so the, uh, well, there we go. That's much better. Oh, that's lovely. Now I'm getting a good impression of it. Lots of dirt still up in there. But now, now, now you can see the, the needle, the conical shape of the whole arrangement. The needle is right at the tip of that. Whoops, conical thing. Let's, let's put it straight up. Focus again a little bit. The objective now is to look for a flat side. Oh, a nice point. Nice point. I'm looking right, I believe I'm looking right at the tip of the needle. Just want to focus up a little bit. Up just a little like that. Of course, the depth of field on a microscope is very limited. So now if you think about where the flat sides would occur, I'm going to try to reflect light off the flat side. I'm going to cut this off here. Oops, wrong way. Now, as I move the light around, we should see a reflection traveling around the cone. Like I say, this is not an easy uh, technique. So if there was a flat side, I'm aimed, I'm aimed right at it now. This is the method that was used years ago. Uh, people didn't have microscopes and whatnot. They have a magnifying glass and you try to do this. Yeah, I've seen it work. So unfortunately I'm not moving the light very consistently here because I'm looking, uh, I'm not looking at the work, I'm looking up at my screen. I think there's just a ton of dirt around there we got to get rid of here before making any kind of judgment. We need, we need something a little more aggressive than the dipping thing. Or just more time spent on it. Let me stop for a moment here and uh, I will spend a little more time doing the cleaning thing. So I'm going to use as a, uh, 
a soft bristle paintbrush. The idea being that the bristles cannot catch the needle. If I'm gentle with it, it shouldn't be a problem anyway. And we'll just we'll just wipe it a little too much. Goodness knows I never did anything like this when I played records. I just played them, played them, played them. Probably like just about everybody. Okay, let's see what that's resulted in. Put this up on its side again. A little bit of light here. What have we got? The whole thing's gone. That looks a lot cleaner. Okay. Um, so again, I'm looking for the little tiny piece of diamond that's at the end of that shaft. that most of that conical shape is not diamond, I believe. That could be wrong. I guess these are, you know, different ones are different. There's nothing really leaping out to tell me that it's it's wrecked. I mean, if it were really wrecked, we would have heard it. Definitely a lot cleaner now. It cleaned along in the direction that it runs through a record. Now you can see I left a pile sort of on the inside of it pile of dirt. Now I'm getting a nice reflection there. And moving the light slowly and carefully. Looking to see if there's a flash of flatness. I'm just passing the flat area. If, it, if there is one, I don't really see it. The idea that the wear of the needle, as it as it flattens down and turns more into like a dragging a chisel through the groove, there comes a point where the flatness reaches the tip, and somewhere before that happens, you want to replace it. I think it's in good shape. I think it's in good enough shape. There's something a little bit funny happening right in there. Goodness knows, I can't I can't tell. I can't tell for sure. That this is the technique directly observing it. It's actually been the best technique for me. I don't know what I do, I just grab it for some dumb reason. I think we can zoom in even closer. Let's take it up to the max here. Okay, we would want to go this way. Is that thing? Oh, fantastic. I just happened to get it right. Put some extra light on it. Now we're really getting a direct look at it. Well, I, you know, when I've looked at these and they've been really bad, they've been really bad. They've been broken off, a flat top. You can see the, the you know, that, that it's not a point anymore. Uh, broken is, is, is really what you would not want. Can I bring this light up from underneath somehow? No, not exactly. Well, that's interesting. Look at that shape. How far into the groove does this thing go? You think that shape there... Um, oh shoot, what am I doing? Okay. I think it's dirt on the needle. I think it's dirt again in line with the way it pulls through the record. Uh, the way I was cleaning it, I didn't really clean it across it. 
try another little cleanup here. One more, one more cleanup. And I think the news is the needle is good. You know, indications are basically, you know, the sound was good. That's pretty hard to argue against it. Okay. I'm going to go across it very gently, though. Not like we can run down to the drugstore and buy a new needle, if you ever could. You can get these. Um, there are places on the internet that list them all out. It's tricky. You have to get exactly the right the right one. They have a meager meager stock here, but they're all kind of used. Exchanging old for old. But all the dimensions in here are all critical. Everything's critical, so you have to get the right needle for for your cartridge, and that's uh, be very tricky today. Got to see what that looks like. It's gone again. It's missing. It's missing in action. Got this on high magnification. Oh, oh, oh! It's coming into view. I'll just stop right there. Use, I'll use the uh, stage adjustment here. To, cause I, there we go. Well, look at that! A needle has emerged. So I think if you look from the point to the right just before it gets into that yellow material you can see a line across across it I think that's that's the end of the diamond I think and the start of the cone that's holding the diamond in place the yellow material must be an additional material they use to freeze everything up on the end there so in this view it's a little dark isn't it in this, this view oh look at that just turn the light right up, John. Oh, that looks great. Okay. Seemed, <laughs> started thinking there wasn't really a needle on the end of it. That ah, looks great. No, there's, there's, there's no way that this can be a problematic needle. Let me try the side light again. Ooh, now we're getting the excellent view of the reflection. So I'm moving the light around, looking for a flat spot. Yeah, perhaps there is a bit of one right up at the point, right in there. I'm not quite right angled to the needle. I'm more right angled to it over here. I think it passes with flying colors. That's my uh, final determination here. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think that's great. I think cleaning it up is only going to make it sound a lot better. And just make sure I've got the right side up here. The little little uh, words are written on this yellow tab. It says 78. You can actually, now that I know how the needle is constructed, I can look right at it and see that that's the LP, long playing. 78s are short playing records. 33s are long playing. 78s are one song on a side, like a, like a, like a 45. One song on a side. That's the whole reason these record players have the dropping mechanism. They're not. It's, it's not so attractive to, to 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 drop 33s, one after another. You can do it. You get too many records uh, stacked up on the player, and there's a slip between them. But on 78s, if you want to play some 78s, maybe it's 1927 and we're playing our 78s again. If you played them one at a time, then you might as well not sit down. Just stand there because the next record's ready to go. But if you could make something drop them, then you could stack you know, eight songs and have eight songs play. And this explains why on a lot of record players, not this one, there's a position where you push the control button called reject, R-E-G reject and what that really means what that really means back then is uh, 
when the third record dropped and your guest who was listening to them with you said well I don't like that song well you could reject it and it would stop playing it and drop the next record so you could reject a record of course the record doesn't come flying out of the player or anything like that that's not that kind of reject okay that's fantastic I think the record player is completed I think I'm gonna leave that strong uh, um, spring in there I think it's harmless uh, I think it's gonna be helpful as long as the record player is never left with this control anywhere than where it is now and that you can do this Oop, we're in the middle of a mechanism thing here <laughs> okay let, let's do that let's get rid of that there the last click now you can tell it the platter is free because it's just spinning so there's no way the intermediate wheel is up against the platter and up against the motor in there it's absolutely critical otherwise you're going to get the uh, railroad train effect coming back wonderful maybe the last thing I want to do is play uh, what might be considered a, a high quality record briefly this is just a, a North American pressing for Chicago there's nothing special about this but having looked at the needle there I think it's really in pretty good shape so I'm gonna bring in a really interesting record we're just gonna play a little bit of it okay found the record I'm interested in trying here this is one of my most special records I'm not saying I love the band rough trade all that much but uh, music's okay uh, she was uh, Carol Pope, she was very big in the uh, late 70s and 80s in and around the Toronto area and that. Special edition, special limited edition, direct to disc recordings, direct to disc. There's a number in it here, the number is uh, 1,928, there's only so many of these records and here's some pictures of the record being made. These are the guys uh, doing the sound, doing the sound. What? There's a guy, what's going on with my camera here? You know, too much light reflecting. Son of a gun. Even that's not going to work very well. <laughs> yeah, fighting with the cameras here. Okay. That's the record master being cut. There's another picture of the guy operating the cutting lathe, cutting the master record. What's different about this record, direct to disc? Stereophonic direct-to-disc recording, the most faithful reproduction of sound yet possible. So, you know, normally a band goes in, and it's probably fairly true today too, I guess only only done digitally. They go in, they go in the studio, music's recorded, back, back at this time we'll go on to huge tape recorders, high, high, high quality tape recorders, many, many tracks, so each instrument, each singer that was on their own track, then afterwards that would all be mixed down into just the way they wanted it to sound. They make a master tape, stereo usually, and then uh, off it goes to, uh, to, to, to a guy like this, who did like, like this, who's going to then take that and cut the uh, master, and then there's a whole uh, process of, you know, master makes mothers, the mothers make the records, and I, I'm not going to go into all that. But the difference here is the tape is cut out completely, the band essentially plays live. The sound they make goes straight onto the mother disc. So that's the difference here. Direct to disc. What you get from that is huge dynamic range. So you get from the loudest to the quietest sounds is greater than you would get in a regular record. I haven't really played this record. I don't know. A few dozen times maybe. I value it. I, I, not many records were done this way. Very, very few. This is certainly the only one I have. <sighs> Just looking at it to see if there's any damage on it. So again, because this is a copyrighted piece of music, I can't just play it, play it, play it. I'd have to make a separate video to do that, or my 50 cents will be robbed from me, and we'll go to Carol Pope or at least whoever owns her, her music these days. So just how different this will sound, you know, on a record player like this, um, you know, from a regular record and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, 
don't have to do it. it it's tricky. It's tricky to, to hear how much better this sounds. I'm going to put on my own headphones here. I think I'm going to cut the uh, microphones down while I do this. Oh, oh, you know what? i got to deal with the hum again. Okay, I'll deal with the hum and get this ready. Okay, so we can get a, a good appreciation of what the record player itself is doing. I'm going to shut off my microphones here, and all we're going to hear is what's coming through that, that cartridge. Okay, that's, that's enough for me to hear. Uh, the sound quality is excellent coming through this record player. There's no doubt about that. Um, this is, I've got another couple high quality records. Uh, this is probably the highest quality one I've got. The only direct to disc one I've got. So uh, just wonderful, wonderful. That's because it's a magnetic cartridge and uh, Fantastic. Well, that's it. Now, obviously, I was putting the volume up and down, trying to fool the YouTube algorithm into not realizing what's on my video. But we'll see what happens when I, uh, you know, I have to get the video all done and then stick it up on YouTube, and then they process it very surprisingly quickly. Eh? They compare every sound on your video to every record ever made. How the heck do they do that? My God. And uh, hopefully, they don't find a match. Fantastic. So what's next is the radio and the amplifier, and we'll work our way through that. Beautiful. Thanks a lot for watching.